On behalf of the City Council, I want to welcome Senator Mikulski back home to City Hall. Thank you, thank you. Madam Senator, congratulations upon becoming the first woman and the first Marylander to chair what many consider the most important committee in the U.S. Senate, the Appropriation Committee. You honor Maryland and Baltimore by your accomplishment. Young Barbara Mikulski was a five-brand community organizer who came out of the ethnic area of East Baltimore. She was a neighbor and community ally of my mentors, Clarence Du Burns, Robert Douglas, and Hattie Harrison. In a time when there was a great social and racial divide, Barbara Mikulski was part of an, of an alliance of diverse people who fought together to preserve the physical and spiritual essence of East Baltimore. They fought against what seemed like at the time the unstoppable power of big government and private development. Against incredible odds and bottomless financial resource, the dedicated group of community leaders won. They won for a lot of reasons, and they won because of the hard working of many people. But one of the prime reasons they won was because of a young woman, Barbara Mikulski, a social worker from Blue Collar East Baltimore. She made people see that they had a stake in their future. She made people believe in themselves. She taught them that they had rights and they could fight, and most importantly, she showed them that they could win. In the end, it was Barbara Mikulski, not development, that became unstoppable. They told her she'll never be a city council person, she became one. They said she'll never be a congressperson, she became one. They said she would never win the U.S. Senate seat, she won it. They said she'll never chair a major Senate committee, need I say more. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to present the senior senator from the great state of Maryland, my senator, your senator, the Honorable Barbara Mikulski. We're going to ask her to rise. Madam Senator, you're already here. I want to present you with a resolution on behalf of the City Council of Baltimore. And it says, the City Council of Baltimore resolution, be it hereby known to all that the City Council of Baltimore offers its, its sincerest congratulations to United States Senator Barbara A. Mikulski in recognition of being the first Marylander and first woman to serve as the chair of the Senate Appropriation Committee. Your historic leadership on behalf of Maryland is inspiring. The entire membership extends best wishes on this memorable occasion and directs this resolution to be presented on this 11th day of March, Resolution 1700, City Council President and all members. Madam Controller, would you please come forward to present your uh, citation? Usually I get a tax bill. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, and it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. And both the Senator and I are both trying to eat healthy. We were in Whole Foods yesterday shopping and had a great time yesterday. Fruits and vegetables. That's right, right. We were in the fruits and vegetables <laughs> section. And I would like to present this citation to Senator Barbara A. Mikulski, United States Senator of Maryland in recognition of your achievement as the first Marylander and first chairwoman of the United States Senate Committee on Appropriations. Congratulations, your remarkable tenure and leadership in public service for the citizens of Baltimore, the state of Maryland, the United States has made a tremendous impact in, our in how our government works. Dedicated service is a quality worthy of special recognition and we applaud your courage, hard work, and determination. Your exemplary character, courage, commitment make you a role model for women throughout Maryland and our nation. Best wishes are extended to you, and may God continue to bless you and keep you in all that you do. Congratulations. Thank you.
Why don't you two get closer? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah, okay. Zach, Senator, you ain't tell me come out to take the picture with mine. <laughs> <laughs> Madam. Come on out here, Jack. <laughs> Let me come around this way. I think I was just getting my bearing. It's called open. I know it. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our Senator, Baba Mikulski. Good afternoon, colleagues in government. Well, it's Monday. It's Baltimore. It must be the city council. <laughs> For five wonderful years, I spent every Monday here at the Baltimore City Council and many other days and many hours in between. I served as a member of the Baltimore City Council from 1971 until through December of 1976 when I left to go uh, to the Congress of the United States. <clears throat> and I'll start my story in reminiscing by telling you how we began every city council meeting after I was inaugurated. When I came to the city council, I had fought the highway. I'll tell you a little bit about that. It was, I was an unlikely winner, and it was a very historic occasion for me to come to the council. <clears throat> In the old days, they had spittoons. Mary Pat, do they still have spittoons? Yes, yeah. yes we do. But we but we don't have any geranium in them the way Well, let me finish the story. So I had a spittoon under my desk, and on my very first day, right after I'd been sworn in, I pulled out my spittoon and said, some people might call this a spittoon. It is a symbol of an old world order, of backroom deals, smoke-filled rooms, men-only signs all over the place. Today, a new day comes to the city council. And as you know, I fought the highway and planted a tree and stood in front of a bulldozer on that very route, route to the highway. But as of today, in my first day in the city council, I hereby declare it not a spittoon, but a flower pot, the symbol of a new day, brightness, sunshine, let a thousand flowers bloom. So I put in a geranium. And thereafter, for every Monday when I was in the city council, we would make the pledge to the allegiance. I would water my plant. The president would look at it, and the meeting would begin. I just miss having my spittoon with me today. Those were such great days. And <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, President Jack Young, I, I really want to thank you for organizing this. This is indeed very touching for me. This is like coming back to you know, my hometown team. This is where, for me, it all got started. This is where I took my activism. When I arrived in the Baltimore City Council, I had a bouffant hairdo, bell-bottom, trousers, and protest signs. And I learned, as you can see from that picture, and like many in this room, I was shaferized, and I learned how to convert my amendments into concrete action to benefit my constituents of East Baltimore and to try to have a new day of coalition politics. So I want to thank you for organizing this and Comptroller Pratt, you honor me by being here uh, as well and I know the mayor wanted to come uh, as well. 1971 was a great year. In January 17th, the Baltimore Colts defeated the Dallas Cowboys and won our very first Super Bowl. Amen. And we're going to be a winning team not only in sports, but in other ways. Apollo 14 had had their third successful lunar landing, and their south tower of the World Trade Center was built and making it the second tallest building in the world. For me, the road to the city council was complicated and difficult. The governance was the politics of political bosses. The city council was very part-time. There were practically no women and very few African Americans. There were six councilmanic districts. There were three members uh, in each district. 
I came from the fighting first, and as I said to Councilman Kraft, we were better at fighting than in coming in first. Um, but however, <clears throat> at that time, reform was in the air. Remember, it was 1971. We were coming out of the politics of the 60s. We were fighting a war on poverty. We were working on a civil rights agenda to desegregate Baltimore and to make it a modern, open, welcoming city to every resident. And along the way, we adopted many of the thinking of the time, one of which was maximum feasible participation, meaning the people who were the most affected should have the most to say. <clears throat> so for me, the road to the city council was an unusual one. With all that atmosphere, I have a master's degree in social work. I went to the University of Maryland School of Social Work, worked at Catholic Charities as a foster care worker, worked at the Department of Social Services as a child abuse worker. Thanks to a grant from the National Institutes of Health, I could go to graduate school and major in a field called social strategy or community organization, organizing people for self-help. And I worked in that all the way through to the late 60s. 1968 was the worst public year of my life until the attack on the World Trade Center and brought us into the global war against terrorism. And in 1968, just think about 1968. This time, in uh, over uh, those many years ago, we had, on March 11th, just observed the march over the Edward Pettus Bridge, the march from Selma to Montgomery, the march looked like it was going nowhere, we took America to somewhere where it was never thought it could go and there would be no turning back. I was out in the streets and I was out protesting, but little did I know, in the midst of all those protests, that Dr. King would be dead a few weeks later, that Bobby Kennedy would be dead a few months after that. And that for me, I couldn't believe then that there was the Chicago Democratic Convention, there was the 19, the November election, and Richard Nixon was in. I decided I was gonna go get a doctorate in public health to get ready for a Democratic president. But along the way, a social, fellow social worker student, Elaine Lowry, came to see me with another student and said, they're gonna run a 16-lane highway through East Baltimore and Wedside. They're gonna take the older European ethnic neighborhoods in Fells Point, we called it the foot of Broadway then, that they're going to not give people relocation benefits. And over in Westside, over in Westside was the community called Rosemont, the first home ownership neighborhood for African Americans. Remember, those homes were bought of the blood and sweat and war, of World War II, the GI Bill. Remember during World War I, excuse me, World War II, the military was segregated, but when they came home, the GI Bill was not. The GI Bill gave opportunities for African Americans to go to college and to buy a home. For many, Rosemont was one of the first home ownership neighborhoods, and it was something to see as it grew and blossomed. And then that's where the highway was gonna go. Well, I won't tell the story of the highway. I went, in, I went to a meeting at St. Stanislaus Church because they said, come on down, everybody knows you, and everybody knows your name because your grandmother runs one of the best Polish bakeries. I went down there, and after that, we went down to Galifus's Saloon, now known as Miss Irene's, then the point. We came out with a militant name called SCAR, Southeast Council Against the Road. We formed a coalition, and that coalition was the symbol of a new day and a new way, where whites on one side of the city formed a relationship, an enduring relationship, with the African Americans on the other. So while we were fighting the highway and we were knocking on doors, I wasn't going anywhere. What I saw, I gave up my graduate school. There was no turning back. But the more we knocked on doors, the more doors were slammed in our face. So I decided I was gonna run for the Baltimore City Council. Everybody laughed at me. They said, you don't have a chance. First of all, you're a woman. You know they're never gonna elect a woman. Second, you don't have the macking of the political machine, the Stasak and Huffberger organization. You can't win unless you have the backing of the machine. And you've also been active in civil rights, then they know 
where you're coming from. I said, yes, they will know where I'm coming from, and I'm going to win. Well, out of that, I put together a, a, a coalition in that first council Manic district, and against the ridicule of that day, I put together a new kind of campaign. It was something that they hadn't seen in Baltimore for a long time. We went door to door. That year, I left and said, I knocked on 17,000 doors, wore out three pairs of shoes, and got mugged by 84 chihuahuas. <laughs> um, and then we put together a coalition. What I said down at Polish Home, I also set up in the housing projects of Perkins Home. There was no race car. It was that everybody be at the table car, that everybody could hear the same story, the same message. What was the agenda? And it wasn't only about the high library. New schools, new libraries, new opportunities. And then, to my surprise, to, to the community's surprise, I won. And it was a great sweep of reform. William Donald Schaefer won. Wally Orlinsky was the president of the city council. There were new folks coming to the council. Dew Burns, Bob Douglas. There were African-American women there, mentors to me, like Vicki Adams, who taught me so much, God rest her soul, and Mary with her indomitable hat. And then there was Wally, Arlen Specter, Ricky, your beloved, who we learned so much from. And along the way, we were beginning to do something called coalition politics. It was a new day in a new way, and I was excited about it. When I, came, uh, when I came to the city council, William Donald Schaefer said, I'm the boss. <laughs> he said, I'm the boss, that's it. And we said, but we're a council. We're an independent form of government. Don't you believe in separation of powers? He said, no, there's only one power. That's me, the mayor. <laughs> and I remember trying to talk to him about charter government. And he said, the charter is one thing, I'm another, I'm the mayor. But Wally, the soul of diplomacy and treaty negotiation, as they were, established the famous Monday lunches. And every other Monday, we would come and have lunch with the mayor to talk about our individual problems, our, ind our community issues, and so on. And it was the beginning of these favorite and famous Monday lunches. And Mary Pat didn't join me until 1975. And in 1975, because there were so few women in the council, when Mary Pat was out going door to door, oh, yeah. they said, why are you running against Barbara Mikulski? That was in Hamden. So I did something. God loved the ethics committee. But on city council st stationery, I wrote her a note that said, this is my friend Mary Pat Clark. She's not running against me. In fact, I'm supporting her. I hope you will vote for me. And I hope, I thank God today, Council President Young, that you didn't file an ethic, nobody filed an ethics charge against me. So I got reelected and Mary Pat got elected. I could go on with story after story, but I'll tell you what we did. That time, because I know maybe this story is late, and I'll talk about legislation in a minute. What happened was, in this council, and maybe it's because we had six districts with three in each, that um, we formed coalitions. Because remember again, it was 1971, 1972. We were trying to get out of Vietnam. We were trying to integrate our schools, our homes, our communities. We formed a coalition, and over in the first, over in East Side, Mary Pat and Ricky, over in East Side, we formed, it's the way it was in the council. They were writing back at me, okay? We formed a coalition with Bob Douglas, Duke Burns, and the beloved Hay. And I would like personally today to give them a round of applause. Because they really were the pioneers and really did outstanding and wonderful things for their community. The happiest day of my life, there was no single happy day, but I can tell you what was the saddest day of my life. 
The saddest day of my life was in the midst of the remodeling of the Baltimore City Council. And it was March of 1976, March or April. And I was out trying to get support for a congressional race because Paul Sarbanes was going to run for the Senate. And I was in a heated primary with attorney with Joe Curry uh, and uh, Judge Burns. And I got a call that there had been a shootout at City Hall. Ed? Yes. I couldn't believe it. That day, over on Calvert Street in the temporary city hall, a deranged constituent came in because they were so unhappy with con uh, an aspect of constituent service. And as they burst into a room that was more like a, a bullpen with council people and secretaries working, this guy came running through using violent and vile language. And Dominic Leone, God rest his soul, of happy and blessed memory, said, stop, stop. You can't shoot anybody. And the guy shot down at Leone. Leone died. And as he dashed down the hall, Bobby, where are you? Your father, Joe. Your father, Joe. Schaefer's floor man uh, in, in the council said, don't shoot. And he tried to shield the secretaries. And as he tried to go forth to shield them, Councilman Fitzgerald, again, of the third Councilmanic District said, don't take these women hostage, take me. Because he kept saying, take me to the mayor, take me to the mayor. And Fitzgerald, putting his own life in the line, said, take me with you. Leave these women alone. This man shot, bleeding. Your father was panting. He was already going into coronary, having his heart attack. They had to take Councilman uh, Curran, Councilman Joe Curran, to the hospital. Fitzgerald walked him over. There was a pass going over there. And as they walked him over, Bob Embry, who was head of HCD, came and saw them. The council had begun to call 911. The police were converging. And as Embry called and yelled to distract him, the killer, the, the killer saw them coming, and he was holding Fitzgerald. And Fitzgerald made sure that until the cops could come and tackle him, held on to him. The assailant shot Fitzgerald. He lived, he survived. He's now retired with his wonderful wife, Mary, that I went to school with, but he took a bullet in his spleen. I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe it. But you know, out of that great tragedy, we understood how fragile life was, how brave some of our members were, and how the council was willing, literally, to put themselves in the line of fire for their constituents. Friends, that was the saddest day of my life. But out of that came a renewed feeling that we're all in it together, that we all needed to look out for each other. Dominic's sac sacrifice. Bobby, your father's willingness to risk his life when he was an older man, giving everything he had. And Fitzgerald, literally willing to offer his own life to save the other council members and those clerical and wonderful secretaries we all had. And out of that came a day where we said, we got to open things up. We have to have everyone at the table. We have to work more to one another. Let's worry about less our individual pothole and our individual library and so on, but how could we all work together? And then that's why we were working with Schaefer to rebuild the Inner Harbor. It wasn't only enough to stop the road, but where were we gonna have a road to go somewhere? And that's where we all began to work. I love the liquor boards. I love going to liquor board meetings. I love going to zoning board meetings. I love doing all the kinds of things that council do. I love the constituent service. I love going to all of the events. But what we wanted to do was build a new Baltimore. Open doors, everyone at the table, coalition politics, and not only about bricks and mortar, not only about building buildings, but building community. Because Baltimore is big enough to be a big city, but small enough to be a village. And I tell you today, as I wrap up these remarks, that it's the same spirit here. I follow you. I know what you're doing. I'm in touch with many of you. All of you should be in touch with my office. Remember, we're big enough to be a big smitty, but we're small enough to be a village, to really work with our people, work with our constituents, work with the leadership of the city, work with our institutions. We are the home. Baltimore is the home of the innovation economy. 
The mayor talks about meds and eds, but meds and eds is where the world's going. We are a wired city. We should be a Google city. We should be looking to the future. And this is where we all need to work together. Everybody, each in their own way. Be best at what you're best at. Be best at what you're needed for. Let's look at the levers of power that you have here, that we have in Annapolis. You've got a great delegation. And for your congressional delegation, you have Ben and I. You have John Sarbanes, you have Dutch, you have Elijah Cummings. This is a turbo team here. So we need to look at what we can do. And the way I see it, physical infrastructure, human infrastructure is the way to go. I'm glad to see CSX is here today. I'm glad that they've come up with this great intermodal plan. We need railroads. We need the Port of Baltimore. We need to have jobs for PhDs and MDs. We have to have jobs for people who go to high school and are willing to work hard every day. Amen. The railroad has a real destination and journey for them. But what does it take? It takes us working together. I'm supporting in the United States Senate something called an infrastructure bank where we could bring in the money, where in Baltimore alone, just think of $2 billion, a billion to fix the Howard Street Tunnel so we could have high-speed rail up and down our corridor and jobs, and in our port, and how about another billion to fix up the water system? Instead of hemorrhaging money through tax breaks that send jobs overseas, bring the money back home, bring the jobs back home, and let's rebuild America. I don't spend as much money. I want to spend as much money on Baltimore as we spent on Baghdad. So just think of our three projects. The Howard Street Tunnel, rebuilding the water system, and how about some money for school construction? Either new or modernization now. Bring this money back home. And then there's human infrastructure. We've got to get behind our kids, whether it's working in our public schools, our charter schools, our school system, to make sure they're ready for the new jobs and the new economy so that there is money <coughs> to educate our children, pay our teachers, pay our teachers, where it's not all on you, no unfunded federal mandates where you tell, we tell you you got to do it, but you got to pay your own way. If we give you the rules of the road, we should help pay the toll charge. That's the way I see it, and that's the way I feel about it. But if we invested in that, I believe that business will come. I know you have many issues, same old issues. Tax, taxes, crime, schools. This is not rocket science. But the fact is, is that you do have rocket science here. You're the home, look at who you're the home of. And I'll conclude with this. You're the home of the Hubble Telescope. It's right out there next to the Hubble, Hubble the Hopkins campus. It is a window on the world. No thanks, I'm fine. It is a window on the world. You're the home to Johns Hopkins. They have as many Nobel Prize winners at one institution. They have more Nobel Prize winners at Hopkins than many states have. You are the home to some of the greatest institutions in America. You're the home to the Port of Baltimore. You have assets that can never leave you. Do an inventory of those assets. The Port of Baltimore can never leave. It's right here. Johns Hopkins will never, they might have an office in China, but they can never be on a slow boat to China or a fast track to Mexico. Let's do an inventory of our assets. Let's strengthen those assets. But you know what the greatest asset is? Our constituents. I've represented them for now for more than 40 years. I just love them to death. I wish I could talk to them every single day. And there are days using social media I think I do. <laughs> I tweet. Some days I'm even a Tweety Pie. But I just want to conclude by saying this. I'm proud of what you do. And we need to think that we're all in it together. Because that highway that went nowhere, we need to think about how we build a highway that takes us somewhere. And that's physical infrastructure, human infrastructure. And the greatest infrastructure is coalition politics. Everybody being at the table everybody having their say, everybody having their day. God bless you and God bless the country that enables to gather in freedom and in fellowship and in friendship to do the job we need to do. Amen.
like to make sure that um, Mary Pat Clark come up and have a few words. The center is on a tight schedule. We have to be in there by 1.30 to take pictures. So Mary Pat, you come. Then we're going to ask Robert to come to present something to Barbara. Send it to Senator McCoskey. Thank you. I like this. <laughs> I'm going to get to Senator Mikulski, thank you so much. You always charge us up, and that goes for the whole state of Maryland. Thank you. We need you, and we're proud of all that you've done. I just wanted to take a moment or two, uh, because we did serve together here in the Baltimore City Council, where Barbara got her start. And I just wanted to take a minute or two to say that I ran for office and was able to be elected in 1975 largely because Barbara Mikulski was already larger than life throughout the city of Baltimore. And yes, it is absolutely true that when I went door to door to run in the second district for city council and Barbara was already representing the first, one after another after another constituent said to me, oh, Mary Pat, you're not running against Barbara Mikulski, are you? Until finally, I asked her to write the note. And she wrote that note. I carried it in my pocket all summer. I, it was worn to a frazzle by the end of that summer because people kept asking me, but as long, because there were so few women in elective office in those days that people figured if I wanted to one of those slots, I must be knocking somebody off and it had to be Barbara Mikulski and they wouldn't stand for it. And so I didn't. And in those days, together in the city council, we had some very, very good times and we were able to get some, um, we were able to rock the boat here, Barbara, uh, Senator, and I'm very proud that we were for the little people, the little people. Even borrowed once a blueback on rent control from, well, Lorraine and Karen weren't taking care of that room in those days. We borrowed it from the file cabinet. We borrowed it from the file cabinet and took it out and we're trying to get enough signatures on it that we could get rent control on second reader. And Ricky, the last call we had to, we were running all over town, and the last call we had to make was to Alan Spector, and it was 1976, and I said to Barbara, Barbara, the only change I have left is a quarter. I'm gonna spend a quarter to make a phone call? She said, use the quarter, we need the vote. Well, anyway, I don't think Alan actually gave us the vote, but we had enough, and so the next day in the city council, surprise, rent control came out on second reader. Because in those days, gang, you just had to sign, you had to have a majority on the blueback. You didn't have to, have, you know, that's what you needed, the signatures on the blueback. And we had it, and we had a good time, didn't we, Senator? Uh, we actually eventually lost that one, but we gave him a fit in the meantime. And so I'm so proud to be here today, Mr. President, Senator Mikulski, my colleagues, past, present, and to come, um, to be able to say thank you for the my own, well, maybe that's not something everybody would be glad about. Thank you for opening the door for women here in elective office, and thank you also for opening the door for people who came out of neighborhoods and causes and issues to be elected to office. Because ladies and gentlemen, before Senator Mikulski, you better be in, you better be coming out of the machine in any district in order to be even considered. And so I will tell this one momentary story that Barbara always told me. She went door to door in 1971, running against the machine. She knocked on 10,000 doors, and here's how she knew she would win. The door would open, there'd be a man, and then his wife would come to stand next to the man. 
And she would say, I'm Barbara Mikulski, I'm running for the, you know, the bakery and of the road. And the man would say, mm, mm. And the woman would go, thank you. Robert, um, please let me be quick because the senator's on a tight schedule. Senator McCoskey, I want to thank you so much uh, for all that you do. I had an opportunity to speak before the Appropriations Committee last summer for uh, prostate cancer funding. So I thank you so much for your work. Uh, one of the things that came out of my prostate cancer experience is the ability to make sure that while I had cancer, I still never gave up on my dream. And uh, Senator, you epitomized that. I designed a shirt that I always have to wear to remind myself. It's called a Dibby Dibby shirt. It stands for dream it, believe it, do it, be it. And you've done all of that. So all right. I'd like to present you with this. Whoa, whoa, whoa.